Hello and happy Halloween. Hope everybody is doing well right now. Um, I know it's been a few days since the storm came through. Hopefully everybody has power and internet and I'm just going to go through what I would have if we had met on Thursday. So we're going to talk about the Middle Ages. And when we talk about the Middle Ages, we have to talk about Christianity because Christianity in many ways defines what the Middle Ages become. And this is going to be looking at Christianity from a historical standpoint, so if it doesn't jive with what you maybe have learned on Sunday mornings, forgive me, uh, I have to approach it slightly differently. So Christianity, it defines the European Middle Ages, but it began, it began long before the Middle Ages actually happened. I mean, we have to go back to ancient Rome. Uh, according to traditions, Jesus of Nazareth is born somewhere around 3 B.C., um, and he's going to grow up to be a teacher, and the teachings of Jesus really follow traditional Jewish laws, traditional Jewish customs, and traditional Jewish traditions. Uh, there's one big change, though, and that's that Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth uh, teaches in his own name instead of the name of Yahweh. Um, traditional rabbis, they taught in the name of Yahweh, and the fact that Jesus was using his own name and saying he was the Son of God, that is the the big thing that kind of changed him from everybody else. Now, Jesus of Nazareth is actually going to disappoint a lot of Jewish people, um, primarily because they were looking for a Messiah who was a real military leader and somebody who would overthrow the Roman Empire that was using uh, the Jewish people as citizens or as subjects. Um, however, Jesus, instead of picking up swords and, and fighting his way through the Roman legions, is going to preach love and peace and is going to teach about the kingdom of heaven. Um, he also is going to teach that traditional Jewish laws should be followed so this is really not going to be the Messiah that the Jewish people want. And so many of them are left disappointed. Uh, there are re very mixed reactions. You've got a group called the Pharisees who are strict observers of the Torah. Uh, they have an issue with Jesus because he was teaching in his own name and not the name of Yahweh. Then you've got another group called the Sadducees. I'm uh, probably not saying that right, but it's close enough. Uh, they have this special combination of Jewish and Roman culture. Uh, and they have a problem because they don't believe in the spirit world. They don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, which are two things that Jesus is going to be teaching. They also just believe in traditional Jewish laws, so they don't like that he's teaching in his own name. Then you have zealots. Zealots were considered violent revolutionaries, and they have an issue because Jesus is teaching love and peace and not revolution. And then last but not least, you have the Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, or Pontius Pilate, or Pontius Pilate. I've heard all three of those pronunciations. He doesn't actually mind the fact that Jesus is going around and teaching. He doesn't mind Jesus proclaiming himself king of the Jews. What he has a problem with is those other three groups who have a problem with Jesus. Pontius wanted one thing, and that was to stop rebellion. He thought rebellion was going to happen. The easiest way to stop rebellion is to get rid of the problem. So Pontius okayed the arrest and the eventual killing of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, we have the beginnings of a religion from this, and it's important to know that just like Buddha didn't start a religion, just like Confucius didn't start a religion, Jesus is not actually the one that starts a new religion. Uh, Jesus died and lived as a traditional Jew, speaking historically, of course. So where does this religion actually come from? It's from St. Peter. Uh, Peter is going to give one of the first sermons after the death of Jesus, and it's Peter who is going to preach and say that Jesus has been resurrected. Now, over time, the baptism is going to become the mark of those who accept the resurrection of Jesus, and Peter, along with other followers of Jesus, are going to spread this new religion throughout Asia, and they're going to actively seek people converting to Christianity. 
Now, Christianity is going to expand, and that's done primarily by Paul of Tarsus. He's going to change Christianity into a full-fledged religion, and Paul is the one that does this because he's really good at speaking in front of crowds. He grew up in Greece, and he was familiar with Rome, so he was better equipped to spread it to Europe. Now, there are some questions that are going to arise. One is, do you have to be Jewish to become Christian, or can you become Christian by yourself? Are Christians still subject to the laws of Moses, or is this the start of something new? Well, Paul is going to make that decision, and he's going to say that Jesus was the son of Yahweh. Uh, Jesus gave the people a new set of laws, and therefore the teachings of Jesus are open to all. In other words, yes, you can become Christian without being Jewish first. Now, Christianity is going to be very appealing. Um, men and women are both accepted into Christianity. Slaves and nobles are both accepted into Christianity. Uh, it's very inclusive, which is something that the traditional Roman life didn't have, the traditional Roman religions didn't have. It's also going to create this sense of belonging. Uh, it promises salvation. It gives an afterlife. Both of those are also things missing from Roman traditional religions. Now, early Christians were persecuted. Uh, the Emperor Nero blamed the, the burning of Rome in 64 AD on Christians. Also, Romans thought that early Christians were cannibals. And I know that might sound weird, but if you are somebody who takes part in communion, uh, you are eating the flesh of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ. And they thought it was real blood and real people being eaten and drinking. Now, we also have to talk about the Byzantine Empire. This is the eastern half of the Roman Empire. This is going to be what really Constantine creates after the Battle of Milvian Bridge and after Constantine beats Maxentius. The official separation between the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire happens in 395. The Western Roman Empire is going to exist for another 100 years or so until the last Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustulus, is overthrown and this, quote, barbarian named Flavius Odysseus is going to declare himself the new emperor. Now, the Eastern Roman Empire is different in a couple of ways. Number one, it has a Hellenistic culture, meaning it has a Greek culture. It, they're going to speak Greek language. They're going to eat Greek food. It's very, very much Greek-centered. Uh, there are more people in the Eastern Roman Empire. It's more urbanized. It's more wealthy. The city of Byzantium becomes the capital city, and Byzantium is old. It's from ancient Greek times. But it's actually rebuilt as a Roman city after a fire um, in the early A.D.s. It's eventually going to be renamed Constantinople. That's the the um, it takes its name from Constantine, is what I should say. And it was the son of Constantine who names the city Constantinople. And Constantinople today it still exists, but today it's known as Istanbul. Now, Constantinople is going to adopt a Roman-style Senate. It's going to have Roman laws, and it's going to have Roman-style government. It's going to have magistrates, just like the Western Roman Empire does. There are two Byzantine emperors that you'll need to know for the final exam. Uh, one of them is Theodosius II. And what he does is he goes back to the western part of the empire and he collects all of the Roman laws and preserves them. And he's also going to provide these laws to the German kingdoms that were seen as barbarians in hopes of civilizing them. The other emperor you need to know is Justinian. And he is going to be best known for something called the Code of Justinian, which is where all of those laws that Theodosius saved are going to be worked out, put into a logical order, and preserved, and then put into use. Um, 
the Code of Justinian comes in three parts. You have the Code, which are the laws itself. You've got the Digest, which are writings by jurists or judges that explain how the laws work. And then you have the Institutes, which is a textbook so everybody can learn the law. Now, the wife of Justinian, uh, her name is Theodora, and Theodora is going to work very closely with Justinian, and she's going to convince Justinian to give women some rights, and women are going to be a little more equal than they ever were before. Nothing like today, but women will be at least considered after Justinian. Now, that picture that you see right there, that is the Hagia Sophia. It was built in 537 B.C. and Not 537 B.C., I have that wrong. 537 A.D., I'm sorry. And 537 A.D. became the largest Christian church, and it became the most elaborate Christian church. Uh, it does still exist today. You could go to the city of Istanbul, and you could tour it. However, it is now an Islamic mosque and an Islamic museum. Another important aspect of Christianity in the Byzantine Empire is the First Great Schism. The First Great Schism happens in 1054, and the Christian church, they are, they are arguing over where the source of the Holy Spirit comes from, what type of bread to use in communion, and how powerful the Pope actually is. And the church is going to break into the Orthodox branch and the Catholic branch. Uh, the Catholic branch, of course, still exists with Catholicism, but all of your Protestant religions like Baptists, uh, Lutherans, Methodists are all part of that branch. The Orthodox Church still exists today, and you have the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, and the Armenian Orthodox. Those are all branches of that side. Now, there are big questions around whether this is the continuation of Rome or if this is something brand new, and arguments for and against still happen today. Um, an argument for it being a continuation of Rome is that they still used Roman laws, they still used the Roman government, and it was part of the Roman Empire. It was a direct continuation. But the argument about it being something new, it's in a different place. It's where Asia and Europe met. Uh, they used Greek and not Latin. They had a Greek-style uh, culture instead of Latin. And both East and West saw them as other. They didn't really fit in with Europe. They didn't really fit in with Asia. They were seen as different. All right, now the Middle Ages themselves um, you can kind of break it into different parts. Uh, the early Middle Ages start around 500 A.D. The late Middle Ages end around 1500 A.D. And the Middle Ages, the big key points, there's a breakdown of Roman power. While the Roman Empire may not exist anymore, the idea of Rome, the memories of Rome, and the influence of Rome, they don't disappear overnight. Uh, Christianity is going to become increasingly strong, and Christianity is going to be seen as a government in some cases, and it's really what keeps Europe together. And then there's this new society that develops that's based on ancient Rome, it's based on the idea of Christianity, and it's based on German societies as well. Now, just real quick, we're not talking about Germany like the country, we're talking about German society as in the people. The country of Germany itself didn't exist until the early 1870s, so don't get those confused. Now, what was this Germanic society? Well, it's not really that much different than what you would study with medieval, medieval um, Britain or something like that. Uh, it's nobles at the top, freemen in the middle, and serfs or peasants at the bottom. Uh, generally speaking, these Germanic societies were fierce warriors. They're not well organized. They're known for their eating. They're known for their drinking. They're known for their gambling. And they gained importance. They gained prestige through warfare. So think, really, knights in shining armor. Think saving damsels in distress. Think of the Renaissance Fest, people walking around with giant turkey legs. I mean, that really is a 
maybe not 100% accurate of a of a depiction, but it's enough to get you in the territory and to understand what's going on. Pretty much every movie about knights you've seen will give you an idea of what Germanic society was like. A Christianity in the Middle Ages, uh, it's broken into three parts. You've got the people who are the believers. You've got the priests who are supposed to serve the ideas to the people. And then after that, you have the bishops who are seen as the teachers. Speaking of bishops, there were five bishops. There's the bishop in Jerusalem, the bishop in Antioch, the bishop in Alexandria, uh, the bishop in Constantinople, and the bishop in Rome. Technically, all five of these were equal, but the bishop of Rome becomes the most equal simply because Rome is such an important city. It was the, the headquarters of the Roman Empire. Early Christianity is based around the idea of monks who are um, priests who serve the church. Uh, priests, these monks usually have no family and they live in monasteries. And monasteries, that's where books are going to be collected. Monasteries are where early church teachings are going to be taught. And the monasteries are going to be places where the religion is spread. Charlemagne is very important. He is the first to put together a large-scale kingdom after the fall of Rome. Uh, he was the king of the Franks. The Franks will eventually become the French, but he's not quite French yet. Um, his kingdom stretched all the way from modern-day France across Europe to where modern-day Poland is. And he was seen as a very well-rounded guy. He is very charismatic. He's a very good fighter. He's a very good warrior. But he's also way into religion. He thinks education is important. And he's just this all-around Renaissance man, if you will. He maintains his power through these personal relationships. So Charlemagne would ride throughout his kingdom meet with people, see what they needed, and he would get personal respect and personal loyalty. Now, in the year 800, the Pope, also known as the Bishop of Rome, is going to crown him the Holy Roman Emperor, which is kind of funny because Charlemagne was not Roman, he didn't consider himself holy, and he's not truly an emperor either. Uh, Charlemagne himself, he never really used the term uh, king, em the Holy Roman Emperor. He just considered himself king of the Franks. Uh, he is going to start in Renaissance before the Renaissance happens. And that's primarily because he's going to start the idea of education. He's going to recreate a version of the Christian Bible. He's going to try and improve the church. And he also creates something called the Carolingian Minuscule. And if you write in lowercase letters, it's Charlemagne you can thank for that. He's the one who created lowercase level letters to make writing easier. Feudalism. Uh, once again, if you've ever seen a knight in shining armor movie, if you've ever been to the Ren Fest, if you know anything about medieval times, you already know about feudalism. Uh, remember, we talked about this with China. You have a lord who gives land away, the person who gets the land becomes a vassal to the Lord. Now, that vassal could turn around and give away some of their land if they wanted to and become a smaller Lord on their own. Now, the king is going to be the top Lord. The king gives away land, and the vassals agree to support the king as a thank you for giving them land. Now, the land that the vassals control becomes known as a manor. So if you've ever heard of a manor house, that's going to be the land directly controlled by the vassal. The serfs work the land for the landlords, or the vassals, if you will. Now, this is kind of an interesting concept, and it may not make full sense without me describing it in person, but I'll do my best. A serf, they are non-free, but they're also non-slave. They're just 
a piece of the land, if you will. They're like another rock. They're like another hill. They're like another piece of dirt. A surf is just there. The surf cannot be sold to somebody else, but the land can, and the surf must go with the land. Now, a serf or a peasant, they have to pay taxes, even though they're not free. And they can also be used as soldiers, even though they're not slaves. Now, the High Middle Ages starts around 1000 and goes to 1300. And this is marked by the incorporation of cities. So if you are a vassal and a city grows up in your land... Uh, that city technically has to go and do business with you and before it can do business with the king. But around 1000 AD, this idea of incorporation comes around, and a, a town or a city could pay fees, and then they could do business directly with the king and cut out the middleman. Now that becomes important because these towns, they could guide their own future, if you will. They can make their own rules, they can make their own decisions, and they don't have to ask anybody else for permission. One of the most important developments that come from the incorporation of cities is the development of the guild. And the guild does still exist today. If you know anybody who is a plumber, carpenter, electrician, anything like that, they are operating in guilds. You have a carpenter's apprentice who is just learning how to put things together. You might have a carpenter journeyman. They know enough they can work on their own, but they don't know enough to do everything. Like They might be able to put up walls by themselves, but they can't yet build an entire house. And then you have a master who has proven his craft. A master builder, a master carpenter can put together your entire house and can teach others how to do it. So that's important. you got the apprentice who's a beginner, the journeyman who knows a little bit more, and then the master is an expert. The Middle Ages, specifically the High Middle Ages, sees this struggle between church and state. By 1000 AD, the church was the most powerful thing in Europe, but the kings were getting very powerful as well. So what would often happen is the lord of the land might give some of the property to the church. But then they would want to control the church too. I mean, I gave the church land. Don't I have a say in what the church does? Well, depending on your point of view, you would say yes or no. If you're the lord, you think, yes, I gave them the land. I could take the land away. But if you're the church... I answer to a higher power. Thank you for your help. But we serve somebody much, much more important. Well, if there's this argument, you might ask, well, why did they give land away? Well, the Lord might want prestige. It looks pretty good if you got enough money to pay for a church. It gives the poor a place to stay. I get to save some money in my pocket because I don't have to pay for the poor people. That's the church's job. It also brings in tourism because people want to come and see the church, and the church was very important. Well, all those people coming to see the church you, you paid for, they're going to need a place to sleep. They're going to need a place to eat. And they might need to buy some clothes or something as well. So there's this real struggle between church and state, and it's not solved until the early 1100s with something called the investiture controversy. Um, it's decided after a little bit of a squabble that the Pope will have control over all matters spiritual and the kings will have control over all matters political. In other words, the kings will have power on earth, the Pope will have power over whatever our next stop is in life. Three teachers you need to know, and I'm sorry to do this for you, but it, it's important. You have to know these three. You've got Anselm of Canterbury, Bernard of Clairvoy, and Peter Abelard. Anselm, he's going to say, um, if you observe the world, then you can understand the Christian God, simply because something had to make the world around us, that thing must be a greater being, and therefore that greater being must be the Christian God. That was his point of view. That was his, his thought process. 
Well, Bernard of Clairvoy is going to say, I'll see you that, but let's use logic. Logically, something had to create the world, and that logical thing is the Christian God. Therefore, if logic tells us that the Christian God is real, then we're more spiritual or more in touch with God. And if we're more in touch with our spiritual side, then we can get to the kingdom of heaven. Abelard. Abelard is going to say, you know what? You can use logic without religion. Logic can be found everywhere. And Abelard, because he's going to remove religion from logic, is in many ways the founder of modern education. This idea that you can use logic to teach, and you can use logic without religion, becomes the idea that begins the modern universities. And in fact, the first modern degree offered in universities was in law. And law is nothing but logic taken to the max. Okay, we got the Crusades too. Some of you may know a little bit about the Crusades, but I'll be honest with you, the Crusades, it's more than I can cover in one class. So this is just the basics. The Crusades, it's completely a struggle between church and state. Um, and you have to go back to the late 900s when a group called the Seljuk Turks take over the Holy Land. And they treat the Christian pilgrims poorly. And if you remember, um, Muslims, they viewed Christians as people of the book. So they were still allowed to come into places like Jerusalem, but their trip was heavily taxed, and they were made to feel uncomfortable. They were stared at. They were you know, booed, if you will. And the emperor of the Byzantines was supposed to guarantee the safety of these pilgrims. Unfortunately, by the time we get to 1000, BC, or 1000 AD, the Byzantine Empire, they're starting to fall apart. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, they're running out of money. There's more fighting breaking out. And so the Byzantine Emperor, he's forced to ask for help. And he goes to Pope Urban II, says, hey, I can't take care of all these pilgrims myself. Will you help me? And Pope Urban II calls for a crusade. Uh, he puts out a call to all of the Christian leaders in Europe and says, let's put together an army and let's go liberate the Holy Land. Now, there's something in this for everybody. The Pope will be in control of a physical army. This physical army will be an international army, and it will show and prove without a doubt that the church has real physical, and political power. The kings and the emperors, they like it because they can get rid of all their troublemakers. People, maybe there's some knights that don't listen, or maybe there's some lords who are causing them problems. The kings can go make them fight. There's also this idea of extra sons. In traditional Europe, only the firstborn son would be able to inherit things. So if you've got a second son or even a third son, um, you know they may need to they may need to um, make their own life, if you will. They may need to um, uh, how do you want to put it? They may need to go make their own fortune. That's a good way to put it there. So these extra sons can go and they can, you know, gain fame, they can gain fortune, and they can make something of themselves. Now, cathedrals, they're a very, very common scene in the Middle Ages. And the more money that the town had, or the more wealth the town had, uh, the more likely it was to have a cathedral. Uh, cathedral is a good way to show off your money because they were so expensive to build. And these towns that are going to build these cathedrals often compete with each other and try to make bigger and bigger and bigger cathedrals. Uh, for example, 
The cathedral at St. Denis was built in 1144. It's considered one of the first of the modern cathedrals. And then Notre Dame in downtown Paris is built in 1163. It's slightly taller than St. Denis. Uh, the cathedral Chartres is built in 1194, and it becomes the place um, that was the biggest of its day. But then in 1247, the city of Beauvais, they try and build a cathedral. It is the biggest one, but the problem is it's so big that it cannot actually stand on its own, and it falls down several times. There are two types of cathedrals. So when I'm talking about cathedrals here, mostly what I'm talking about are Gothic cathedrals. Uh, Gothic cathedrals are big and fancy. The picture on the left, that is of a Gothic cathedral. Uh, they've got stained glass windows, tall ceilings, pointed arches. Uh, the picture on the right, that's a Romanesque cathedral. They are older, and the Romanesque cathedrals, uh, they kind of doubled as forts. It's really a fortress that pretends to be a, a church, as I wrote there. Um, they've got stone roofs, uh, very small windows. They've got thick walls. They're they're dark, and um, they're much more um, sturdy, if you will. They're they're not for show. Now, the late Middle Ages, 1200 to 1500, um, primarily the Black Death, which is kind of timely considering what we're doing today. And before I talk about the Black Death, I have to put in a secret word just so I know that you read this and you listen to this. The secret word in honor of the death of Sean Connery, the best James Bond. Today's secret word is Goldfinger. Goldfinger is one of my personal favorite movies of all time. Goldfinger was James Bond and Sean Connery at his finest. So today's secret word is Goldfinger. All right, so now that I've got the secret word Goldfinger out of the way, let's talk about the Black Death. Uh, the Black Death it's also known as the Black Plague. It's known as the Bubonic Plague. They're all the same thing. And it comes to Europe in 1347. Uh, what had happened was, is in the middle of the 1300s, the Mongols were attacking cities throughout the world. And a city called Kaffa, K-A-F-F-A, or sometimes it's known as Jaffa, J-A-F-F-A, um, was under attack, and there were some Italian traders uh, doing business in there, and when the Mongol army starts to load up dead bodies, put them on catapults, and fling them over the walls of the city, these Italian businessmen say, uh, no thanks, and they run back home to Italy. Well, they don't just bring themselves back, they bring some rats, and they bring some fleas, and they bring the disease back. Now, this is a very, very nasty disease. I'll let you look up some pictures. There may even be some pictures in the textbook. But what happens is your lymph glands start to swell, and they form these big, giant lumps. Uh, you can lance open your lymph node and drain it, and that gave you a very small chance to survive. And I do mean very small. Um, there was no treatment for this other than that. Uh, the victims who have the disease, they would start to bleed under the skin. The skin would start to turn black. They would start to cough up blood. They would cry blood from their eyes. And then a fever so high that the, the people would lose their mind would happen. And the fever was so bad that people would just jump into water trying to cool themselves down. Uh, you usually have three days at the most after showing symptoms to live. Now, your chance of getting the Black Death, over 90%. Mortality rate, over 70%. More than 25 million died. Modern-day researchers, because this is still something that we're looking into, put the number of deaths closer to 55 million. Not only that, but there were three forms of the plague. There was the bubonic plague, which meant carried by fleas and rats. 
There is a septicemic plague, which meant carried by blood. You could transfer from blood to blood. And then there was the pneumonic plague, which meant it was airborne. Now look at those numbers. If you're bitten by a flea that has the plague, it can be as much as 70% fatal. If it is the blood transferred plague that you get, maybe you touch somebody else's blood and you get sick, that was 100% fatal. And then the airborne plague was 100% fatal as well. In fact, the pneumonic plague was 100% fatal all the way up to World War II. Now, why was the Black Death so deadly? Well, it's the first outbreak of a plague in 800 years. There's no immunity to it. It became very easy to spread. It spread through the lungs, which is in some ways similar to what COVID-19 has been doing. It, it has developed into a pneumonia-based disease, and it can spread through the lungs. It mutated, and COVID-19, they have recently discovered, is mutating as well. Um, there's hunger. Being hungry means that your immune system is weaker. Poor nutrition weakens your immune system. And then there's a lack of sanitation. Uh, they didn't have running water. They didn't have sewer. So uh, many, many ways to get sick. Now, if the plague is not treated, it is still fatal today. And overall, 40% of all plague cases were fatal as late as World War II. Now, will COVID-19 turn into another Black Death? It is unlikely because of medical advances, but COVID-19 is not something to mess with. I do not want to get it, and I urge all of you to continue taking care of yourselves because the numbers are on the rise again. Now, what were the reactions to the plague? Well, first of all, in honor of Halloween, uh, some of you may dress as, as a plague doctor, and you may not know where that comes from. Uh, the plague doctor, that picture you see there, that was the, the outfit worn by those trying to treat the plague. And you may wonder why it has the beak. It's because they would put smelling salts or strong smelling flowers at the end of the beak to try and block out the smells of death and the smells of, of people dying. And it was also thought that good smelling things would help keep you from getting the plague. Now, what were the immediate reactions to the plague? Well, church clergy die in large numbers. Uh, if you're a good Catholic, one of the last things that you're supposed to get are your last rites. And last rites are given on the deathbed, which is where many of these plague victims were at their most, um, their most dangerous because it was easiest to spread the disease. People look for something to blame or someone to blame. And the number one group of people blamed were Jewish people because they were seen as against the Christian God. Some people react with parties. It's the end of the world as we know it. Some people turn to religion. Only God can save me. And then some people turn to becoming hermits, saying, if I stay indoors away from everybody, I'll be safe. Longer-term reactions are varied. In, for, in some ways, and this is horrible to say, the plague turns into a good thing. And that's because those that survive... They get better land, they get better nutrition, they get better jobs, and they make more money. Uh, there are also peasant revolts in both England and France that can trace their, their beginnings to the plague. And then people marry earlier simply because uh, there aren't as many people to go around. Now, the Hundred Years' War will cover next week. Well, I should be able to do that in person as long as nothing happens. So we will... See you on Thursday. I hope everybody has a great Halloween. And don't forget to answer the quiz with the secret word. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.